Hey everyone, Will here. So for today's video, we are going to be analyzing the War of 1812. That means we're going to be going over all aspects of this event, including the details that led up to this event, the details during this event, and the details at the end of this event. So without further ado, let's begin. So the War of 1812 was a war fought between the United States and Great Britain over British restrictions on U.S. trade and the kidnapping of U.S. sailors. The War of 1812 took place between the dates of June 18, 1812 and February 18, 1815. So the War of 1812 started during the Napoleonic Wars. The Napoleonic Wars were a series of major conflicts between the French Empire and a group of opposing European countries, led by Great Britain. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British Royal Navy, led by Lord Nelson, scored a major victory against the French naval fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. This victory gave the British Royal Navy complete jurisdiction and control over the seas near North America. During the Napoleonic Wars, the U.S. had maintained its neutrality despite pressure from both the French and the British to support their respective navies. At this time, U.S. merchants began exporting Spanish and French goods into European ports. This in effect caused British merchants' West Indies products to decline in value. As a result of this, Great Britain began a blockade of French-controlled European ports. This severely harmed American trade and created increased tensions between Great Britain and the United States. As this was all happening, many British sailors deserted the British Royal Navy after witnessing the horrors of seaside warfare. Many of these British sailors enlisted in the United States Merchant Marine, a group of U.S. civilian and federally owned merchant vessels. In order to retrieve the deserting British sailors, the British Royal Navy began to board American ships, practicing the act of impressment. Impressment was when a Royal Navy would board foreign vessels and force sailors into Royal Navy servitude. At this time, citizenship was a complicated topic, and many American sailors didn't have official paperwork to prove their citizenship. Many British deserters also tried to forge paperwork which complicated the process even more. This caused the British Royal Navy to capture all sailors on American vessels and force them all to serve the British Royal Navy. The policy of impressment helped Great Britain in two major ways. Firstly, it disrupted American overseas trade with France, and secondly, it gave the British Royal Navy additional sailors to use in their conflict with the French and the Spanish in the Napoleonic Wars. This made United States political leadership angry for two main reasons. Firstly, the British were hurting U.S. trade. And secondly, Great Britain was directly contradicting the notion of American sovereignty. U.S. sailors were also upset by this forced servitude, particularly because they were forced to militarily serve a country they did not affiliate with. Life in the British Royal Navy at this time was extremely dangerous, disciplined, and provided very little pay compared to the wage of an American sailor. Between 1803 and 1812, the British Royal Navy reportedly captured between 5,000 and 9,000 American sailors forcing them into servitude. During all of this, many American politicians started to push for war with Great Britain. These individuals later became known as War Hawks. The War Hawks consisted of 20 Democratic-Republican congressmen who supported U.S. expansionism. Many War Hawks were pushing to add Canada and Florida to the Union while also pushing to overcome Native American resistance movements in the West. As the concept of U.S. expansionism grew more and more popular, many of the Warhawks also began to express frustration towards Great Britain's policy of impressment and their intrusion on free trade. 
Both the concept of U.S. expansionism and the policy of British impressment helped propel the Warhawks to power in Congress. And in 1811, two prominent Warhawks, Henry Clay and Peter B. Porter, were both delegated powerful positions in Congress. With Henry Clay being elected Speaker of the House and Peter B. Porter being named Chairman of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. These powerful developments within Congress eventually led to increased U.S. military spending in preparation for the impending war with Great Britain. On June 4, 1812, the U.S. House of Representatives voted by a margin of 79 votes to 49 votes to declare war with Great Britain. Then, on June 17, 1812, the U.S. Senate voted by a margin of 19 votes to 13 votes in favor of the declaration of war on Great Britain. It should be noted that this was the closest congressional vote in American history to formally declare war with another nation. The final move towards war was made on June 18, 1812, when U.S. President James Madison signed the Congressional Declaration of War against Great Britain. Now at the time, the British Navy vastly outnumbered the American Navy. The American Navy consisted of 18 ships, while the British Navy consisted of over 1,000 ships. Despite this, however, most of the British Army was off in Europe, busy fighting in the Napoleonic Wars. This in turn caused the British to adopt a defensive strategy throughout the duration of the war. The British Army also replied upon assistance from the Tecumseh Confederacy, a league of 15 Native American nations determined to stop American expansion. The major combat in the War of 1812 happened in three main areas. The Northwest Frontier, the American South, and the Atlantic. These places are now called the three main theaters of the War of 1812. The Northwestern Theater was known for having some of the bloodiest and most gruesome battles in the War of 1812, with both the British and the Americans having difficulty supplying and reinforcing troops in outposts located in the Western Great Lakes region. One of the first battles in the Northwest was the Siege of Detroit. The Siege of Detroit was a battle between British forces and U.S. forces from August 15th to August 16th in 1812. British forces consisted of soldiers commanded by Major General Isaac Brock, along with Native American warriors led by Shawnee leader Tecumseh. U.S. forces consisted of soldiers commanded by the Brigadier General William Hull. On August 15th, 1812, British gunners of the Provincial Marine began bombarding Fort Detroit with two ships, General Hunter and Queen Charlotte. Then, on the morning of August 16th, 1812, Tecumseh's warriors crossed the Detroit River. They were quickly followed by three of Major General Isaac Brock's brigade units. Brock advanced to the rear of Fort Detroit, where defenses were weakest. Tecumseh's warriors then proceeded to repeatedly move past a gap in the forest where U.S. forces could see them. This was done to make U.S. forces believe there were two to 3,000 Native American warriors, when in actuality there were only 600. U.S. Brigadier General William Hull feared the size and scope of the impending attack and in turn surrendered his entire fort. Many historians speculate Hull made this decision to protect his daughter, who was in the proximity of the impending attack at the time. The loss of Fort Detroit caused major problems for the U.S. on the Northwestern Front, with many more Native Americans choosing to side with the British. The loss of Fort Detroit also led to Brigadier General William Hull being relieved of his duties. Shortly following this, Brigadier General James Winchester was given command of the U.S. Army in the Northwestern region. Winchester, similar to Hull, did not strategically seek to retake Detroit, and as a result of this, he was quickly demoted to second-in-command. 
This led to Major General William Henry Harrison's ascension to commander of the Northwestern U.S. Army. Harrison's first action as commander was to retake Detroit. In order to do this, he divided his army into two columns. Harrison would lead one column, while Winchester would lead the other column. Harrison had given orders to Winchester to remain near the Maumee River as U.S. forces moved in to take back Detroit. However, Winchester ignored these orders and sent a detachment of his own force to Frenchtown. Winchester did this after being informed by local settlers about British plans to burn Frenchtown. The Battle of Frenchtown began when General Winchester dispatched Colonel William Lewis and 700 U.S. soldiers to retake Frenchtown. On January 21, 1813, after successfully retaking Frenchtown, General Winchester arrived at the settlement. Although U.S. forces had occupied Frenchtown, they knew the British would be sending more forces to retake the settlement. For this reason, Colonel Lewis instructed his men to hide behind the picket fence lining the fort, having them cut holes through the fort. These holes would be used to fire musket balls at incoming enemy soldiers. The next day, on January 22, 1813, British Colonel Henry Proctor led an attack on the settlement, with a force of 600 British soldiers and six six-pounder cannons. Accompanying the British soldiers were 600 to 800 Native American warriors led by the Wyandotte chief, Roundhead. The defensive line remained strong, but was eventually overrun by the overwhelming force of British soldiers and Wyandotte warriors. As U.S. soldiers retreated their defensive line, they were ambushed in the forest, with many being tomahawked, scalped, and killed. A few of the soldiers removed their boots and retreated only wearing their stockings. This left footprints in the snow that resembled that of moccasins, thus allowing the shoeless soldiers to retreat without being followed by the Wyandotte warriors. General Winchester was quickly captured by Chief Roundhead during the fighting. Chief Roundhead stripped General Winchester of his uniform after capturing him and quickly turned him over to the British Army. Shortly following General Winchester's capture, U.S. forces surrendered Frenchtown to the British Army. After U.S. forces surrendered Frenchtown, British Colonel Henry Proctor quickly marched uninjured prisoners across the frozen Detroit River to Fort Malden. The soldiers that were injured and unable to walk were left at Frenchtown and killed by remaining Native American warriors. The warriors also set fire to buildings that housed the wounded soldiers and killed any of the soldiers that managed to escape the burning buildings. The slaughter of wounded American soldiers on January 23, 1813 quickly became known as the River Raisin Massacre. The massacre was particularly devastating to Kentucky since many of the soldiers killed were Kentuckians themselves. The rallying cry, Remember the Raisin, led many more Kentuckians to enlist in the war effort. The Atlantic Theater was another main arena in the War of 1812. U.S. Navy vessels struggled to defend against British invasions onto the Atlantic coast. The biggest failure in the Atlantic Theater was the burning of Washington. The burning of Washington was a British invasion into Washington, D.C., the capital city of the United States. On August 24, 1814, after defeating American forces at the Battle of Bladensburg, a British force led by Major General Robert Ross set fire to the White House, the Capitol building, and other U.S. government buildings. The burning of Washington marks the only time since the Revolutionary War that a foreign power had captured and occupied the United States Capitol. Less than a day after the attack, thunderstorms came through the city putting out all of the fires. This caused the British to retreat the city and move back towards their ships. The American South Theater was the final area where much of the fighting took place. Both Great Britain and the U.S. knew the strategic importance of taking the South, 
which was why in the latter years of the war, much of the fighting congregated in that area. One of the biggest battles on the Southern Front and in the War of 1812 itself was the Battle of New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans was the final major battle in the War of 1812, pitting the British Army led by Major General Sir Edward Pakenham against the U.S. Army led by Brevet Major General Andrew Jackson. Ironically, the battle actually took place after the War of 1812 officially ended. This was primarily because the news of the signing of the Treaty of Ghent did not reach the U.S. in time. In the autumn of 1814, more than 50 British naval ships commanded by British Major General Sir Edward Pakenham sailed into the Gulf of Mexico, preparing to attack New Orleans, Louisiana, primarily in hopes of aiding British expansion into U.S. territory acquired through the Louisiana Purchase. On December 1, 1814, U.S. Major General Andrew Jackson insisted that the U.S. military speed up defense preparations for the ensuing battle. In a short period of time following General Jackson's arrival, word came out that the British forces had been sighted near Lake Bourne, which was to the east of New Orleans. Reacting to this, General Jackson quickly declared U.S. martial law that required the military service of every abled man in the area. In response, over 4,000 men were commissioned to defend the city of New Orleans. These 4,000 men came from a variety of different backgrounds. Freed enslaved Africans, Kentucky militiamen, pirates, Tennessee militiamen, and Crayola farmers all came to the defense of the city. In order to properly defend the city, Jackson ordered construction on what has now become known as Line Jackson. Lime Jackson was a defensive structure spanning from the Mississippi to a large swamp. The structure consisted of large logs and cotton bales coated with mud. This structure defended both U.S. forces as well as U.S. battery cannons. The battle started with two major British offensive attacks. In order to deal with this, General Jackson split his forces into two defensive squadrons one of which was on the east bank of the Mississippi River, and the other of which was on the west bank of the Mississippi River. The east bank consisted of 4,000 troops and eight battery cannons under the command of General Andrew Jackson, while the west bank consisted of 1,000 troops and 16 battery cannons under the command of General David Morgan. After a series of minor offensive strikes, the British Army finally decided to make a full-blown offensive strike against U.S. forces. On January 8, 1815, British Major General Sir Edward Pakenham commanded approximately 8,000 British troops to attack U.S. defensive lines head-on. In the midst of battle, the British Army faced major casualties and lost General Pakenham to a fatal bullet wound. This led to British General John Lambert to assume control of the British Army. However, at this point, the battle was already lost. General Lambert quickly accepted defeat and withdrew his forces into retreat. U.S. forces remarkably faced less than 100 casualties at the battle, while British forces faced over 2,000 casualties. Although the Treaty of Ghent had already ended the War of 1812, the United States' decisive victory at the Battle of New Orleans had major domestic implications for the U.S. in the years to come. The Battle of New Orleans was a pivotal event that helped kickstart both the era of good feelings and Andrew Jackson's political career that would take him to the U.S. presidency in 1829. In April of 1814, British public opinion for the War of 1812 plummeted due to heavy wartime taxation being placed upon British citizens. The end of the Napoleonic War also made the British eager to end the War of 1812, since blocking American trade with France was no longer a major priority for Britain. The final agreement was that both sides would keep their respective territories, while also exchanging wartime prisoners in the process. 
the diplomats of both nations also made discussions of ending the international slave trade as well. Overall, the War of 1812 was a very small event in British history, while being a huge event in American history. The War of 1812 ensured a mostly peaceful century for both nations until the outbreak of World War I. The real losing side in the War of 1812 were Native Americans. As a proportion of their population, Native Americans suffered the most casualties in the war, while also having no European allies in North America after the war. Their plans for a British protectorate Indian state in North America were ruined, and most tribes were left on small reservations with little to no power or influence over the New World. Thank you for checking out our video! If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more additional content. If you have any ideas for a future video topic, please leave a comment and let me know what you would like to see me cover next. I'm really hoping to grow this channel and provide you all with more content in the future, and your support means the world to me. Thanks everyone!